Do you think that most of that inflammation as we age is coming from the gut and lipopolysaccharide oh, yeah. and the toxin? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is – so uh, the, uh, other studies uh, show that if you give uh, animals charcoal, activated charcoal, they basically lit, retain most of their lean muscle mass and they look relatively young even in a very advanced age. Um, and the one thing that charcoal is known to do because it's not supposed to absorb into the bloodstream, so whatever it's doing, is doing it in the gut. And I don't know if anything else is happening in the gut other than the synthesis of serotonin and basically the, 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 the release of endotoxins from the bacteria and charcoal can bind both. Um, coincidentally, um, drugs that act as antagonists of the endotoxin receptor, TLR4, as well as serotonin antagonists have, have been shown in multiple animal studies to extend lifespan, which shows kind of confirms that these two are really driving the aging process uh, or at least the morbidity process and that charcoal by basically binding it and reducing their effect on the organism is helping extend lifespan. So, so yeah, kind of very good, like kind of like linking of the original findings about less calories, but by looking deeper into it, you realize that it's not the calories, it's actually what you're eating. That's super interesting. Now, this has always been something that I've found interesting about Ray's work and your continuation of it, um, is that this bioenergetic perspective isn't really a fan of starchy foods. A, a lot of people get their carbohydrates from starchy foods, whether it's sweet potatoes or... Um, like oatmeal or things like this that are starchy. And as I've come to understand, is the, the concern here is really that you don't want, it, we possibly do not want undigested food yeah. moving into the colon because that is how, that is one hypothetical way that we might increase the populations of these gram-negative bacteria and then lead to increased LPS in the blood and this inflammation cascade that we're talking about. So this is kind of interesting. I mean, is this, in some ways, an argument for a fairly low fiber diet? Uh, not low fiber diets, but but you can consume the fibers, but they should be mostly of the insoluble kind. If you're uh -huh. eating, if you're eating a lot of rice, and I think if you're eating a lot of potatoes, I think they do a decent amount of soluble fiber. Um, uh -huh. But the danger of thing of the starches, if they're actually if they're the easily digestible as the simple carbs, which is what you're gonna find in white rice and potatoes, if they're well cooked, they're probably not gonna re uh, increase much the endotoxin because they're gonna get absorbed before they reach the you know the column. Now right. you could have a problem in people lately because of they're taking a lot of PPI drugs like the antacid drugs, so the reduction of the production of stomach acid kind of opens this pathway to the bacteria to actually start colonizing the small intestine. And that's not a good thing. Like the, I think SIBO is now a, a thing, right? Small intestine yeah, bacterial small overgrowth. Intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Yeah. So if you have that, actually eating starchy foods is probably going to be problematic, even if they're the simple kind of carbs that, that uh, you know, like white rice and potatoes. But if your small intestine is clean, I know a lot of people that can actually thrive on starch if it's well cooked and if it's consumed with a little bit of butter uh, or cheese um, or, you know, some saturated fat or, or even olive oil. Uh, but then I know other people who basically cannot do any starch because they immediately get the flushing reaction. Uh, they start sweating a lot and whatnot. And to me, that's a sign that basically they're having a uh, like an endotoxin uh, reaction to the starch. So it doesn't hurt to try, but I would make sure that always the starch is well cooked. And if it's, and it's of the simple kind, no resistant starch is there. Like basically whatever good the resistant starch will do, you'll be uh, many times overcompensated for in a negative way by feeding the bacteria in the, in the colony. That's a really important point because when people make potatoes, they're going to cook and cool the potatoes. They say right. cooked and cooled potatoes are this resistant starch. And I remember I've even... People will just eat potato starch just to get this more resistant starch. So that, so what sort of foods, from your perspective, should people avoid that that might worsen lipopolysaccharide from the colon? What kind of things would people avoid, like oats or yeah, uh, non non fully cooked oats? And I know a lot of people that eat them semi raw because you know they want to get these resistant starches, they want to get the fiber. But remember, right. most of the cooking is not going to destroy the insoluble fiber. You got to cook for a very long time to completely destroy the insoluble fiber. So you are getting, but it will destroy the soluble one. And I think that's one reason. If, actually, if you look at the, some of the traditional cultures that are over-consuming starches, like the Tsimani tribe, which I think mm -hmm. is in uh, the Amazonian, 80% of their diet of the calories are from starches. They eat, they eat like tapioca, some other roots that are mo most basically like potatoes. And they, that's 80% of their calories. But they cook these things for, I don't know, for at least an hour. And it basically becomes like this paste. And it's like uh, mashed potatoes. Uh, but they're fully cooked. Um, and they, these people have the lowest incidence of cardiovascular disease known of any tribe in the developed country or not. Um, and so it shows you that you can travel starch, uh, but it needs to be well cooked. And I think that so the brown rice, the oats, 
um, like the, um, uh, the, the now they're selling these different types of breads in the stores that are basically they look like they're very like um, I don't want to go they have they have something they, they have nuts in them that's another thing that I don't particularly like but also like the flour is not the white processed flour that we're used to seeing in a regular bread it, it looks very browny and basically it's it's advertised that this is basically consists of um, you know the se semi-processed carbohydrates from wheat but they're done in such a way that they're basically they're not processed so you ingest them in the raw format which probably means they have a lot of phytic acid as well phytic acid i think it's called that's not a good thing for you for your gut um, it can cause actually an allergic reaction in fact i think uh, a deriv derivative of it phytanic acid is actually used as an adjuvant in vaccines because if it gets into your bloodstream it triggers an inflammatory reaction so, mm -hmm. so, so these hard to process starchy foods that are advertised for their low glycemic index, that's what I would actually avoid. It's not the insulin that does you in. Uh, in fact, you do want, it's a perfectly normal thing when you're eating a very, a food with a very high glycemic index, such as white rice, it's perfectly normal to, for your insulin to spike, but then it's going to drop after that. If you are, you know, regular, healthy, non-insulin resistant person. But with the resistant starches, you may not get the, you know, as, as, as elevated insulin response and blood glucose response as you will get with the white bread. However, you will pay for that multiple times over with the high endotoxin, which is going to increase your inflammation. And at some point, you might find that your insulin, the baseline insulin is high, and you don't know why. And the doctor is saying, I don't know why. But if you measure the cortisol, you'll see that it's also high. And cortisol and insulin, uh, in, in, from what I've seen, they always go together. The role, really, the primary role of insulin is to prevent a rapid drop in blood glucose, which can send you into a coma, and basically, because the brain is so sensitive to uh, to the drop in blood glucose. Type one diabetics know this, so they basically they, they're okay with insulin spiking. They'll inject, I'm sorry, with the blood glucose spiking because they'll inject insulin. They're not okay with blood glucose dropping, uh, you know, uh, too low. So, so yeah, so these these resistant starches that are advertised for the low glycemic index, those are the foods that I, that I would avoid. The ones that are um, medium and high glycemic index tend to be less dangerous for us in the long run, uh, because it's not really it's not the carbs that actually cause insulin resistance. I think that's the biggest biggest misconception, which I hope we uh, manage to dispel a little bit. It's the fats and specifically the pro-inflammatory fats that are driving you, you know, um, obese and diabetic. Yeah, I want to get into the polyunsaturated fatty acids later in this podcast, but I think that's just important to drive that point home that that if people are looking for resistant starches, they, they might want to reconsider that perspective. I've heard people in the health space say they want to eat green mangoes and green bananas and unripe fruit. And I'm thinking, that doesn't make any sense evolutionarily. We would never no have animal done that. It. No animal eats it. It's voluntarily. Do you know of any animal in nature that likes green bananas? I don't. Even monkeys refuse it in the zoo. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, why would you do that? And so you don't want the resistant starches. And, and we've, I, I believe we've talked about this on previous podcasts, but it, that's important. And if people are curious, please go back to the first two podcasts that Georgie and I did. This idea that carbohydrates lead to insulin resistance is, is just really not substantiated by the medical literature. Mm -hmm. Now, neither, I, I don't think that either of us is a fit. I know that neither of us is a fan of high fructose corn syrup. And we would, we would prefer that people eat nutrient rich whole foods yep. but to suggest that honey is causing diabetes is false to suggest that that carbohydrates from potatoes are causing diabetes is false and i think both georgie and i believe that it's it's these polyunsaturated fatty acids long term that are creating problems at the level of mitochondria we'll get to that later in the podcast but